Welcome to the Watershed Moment uh, podcast. We're diving into something uh, pretty amazing today. Artificial intelligence and how it's changing flood prediction and and how we get ready for floods. Mm -hmm. We've got two really cool sources for this deep dive. One is straight from Google, all about their new AI model for global flood forecasting. Okay. And the other is a nature publication, which looks at how AI is is changing predictions for extreme floods, mm -hmm. especially in areas that, that don't have much historical data. Yeah, that's a really important topic, especially when you think about the impact that floods have around the world. You know, they are the most common natural disaster. Right. And and the effects are felt the strongest in developing countries. Yeah. And it, it's a problem that's that's only getting worse. The Nature paper mentions that flood related disasters have more than doubled since 2000. Oh, wow. Which is, uh, you know, it's a pretty stark reminder of why we need better, you know, more effective warning systems, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in those regions that are that are really vulnerable. Yeah. And the World Bank estimates that upgrading flood warning systems in developing countries mm -hmm. to match those in developed nations could save something like 23,000 lives each year. So that's that's the kind of impact that we're talking about. That's huge. It's yeah. it's a it's a powerful reminder of how much is at stake here. Yeah. So let's let's dive into the solution. Uh, Google has developed this new AI model that's that's generating a lot of buzz. Right. Um, it builds on a previous version, and now it can predict floods a full seven days in advance. Wow. Which is, I mean, that kind of lead time is is absolutely critical for communities to be able to prepare and, you know, potentially save lives. Absolutely. And what's really impressive is the scale of this new model. It covers over 100 countries. Wow. Through Google's Flood Hub platform. So that means it could impact the lives of 700 million people. That's incredible. And they've also made the GRRR data set that stands for Google Runoff Reanalysis and Reforecast publicly available. So this data set is like a gold mine for researchers because it contains decades of river flow data, which allows them to, to test new models and understand long-term flood trends. That's fantastic. Now, one of the things that really caught my eye in the Nature paper was was this focus on ungaged watersheds. Mm -hmm. Can you can you explain what those are and and why they're so challenging for traditional flood forecasting? Yeah, absolutely. So ungaged watersheds are basically areas where we don't have a lot of historical data about river flow. Oh, yeah? And traditional hydrological models, they really rely on this data right. to make accurate predictions. They need to be kind of calibrated for each specific watershed. Okay. But AI really changes the game here. How so? Well, AI models can learn from global data. They can identify patterns and relationships that mm. hold true across different regions, which means that they can make these really accurate predictions, even in these ungaged watersheds oh. where traditional models really struggle. And the Nature paper highlighted this um, by showing that the AI model's accuracy yeah. in predicting extreme floods in data sparse regions like Africa is actually comparable to the accuracy of of existing forecasts in data-rich Europe. Wow. So that's a huge step towards addressing the global inequity in flood preparedness. It really is. It's it's exciting to see how AI is leveling the playing field, so to speak, yeah. in terms of access to, to reliable flood forecasting. Yeah. But of course, the big question is just how reliable are these AI predictions? Right. Especially when it comes to those extreme events, because those are the ones that can have the most you know, devastating consequences. Right. That's the that's the key question. And the Nature paper, they dove right into that. They compared the AI model to the current gold standard, mm -hmm. which is the Copernicus Emergency Management Service Global Flood Awareness System. OK. It's called GLOFAS. GLOFAS. Got it. And what they found was was pretty remarkable. OK, tell, tell me more. I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat here. OK, so for events exceeding a five year return period. Yeah. So imagine a flood that's so big. It only happens on average once every five years. The AI model is as accurate as GLOFAS is for one year events. Wow. Even more impressive, its five day forecasts are as reliable as GLOFAS's now casts, which are basically predictions for the present moment. So this AI model is not only predicting further in advance, but it's doing so with accuracy that rivals like the best available systems. Exactly. That's that's a huge leap forward. It is. It seems like this this could really be a game changer for disaster preparedness, mm -hmm. especially in those regions that have historically lacked those those really reliable forecasting tools. Yeah, absolutely. But but I'm curious, the, the nature paper also dug into some of the nuances of where the AI model performs best. Right. 
and and where there's there's room for improvement. Can you can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So they found that the AI model tends to perform best in smaller basins. Okay. So this is valuable information because it helps us understand you know the model's strengths and its limitations. Right. And it points to areas for future refinement. They also found that factors like aridity or how dry a region is mm -hmm. can influence the model's accuracy. That makes sense. Which makes sense because you know flash floods and deserts, for instance. Right. They can be really hard to predict because the rainfall is so rapid and localized. Yeah. So so it's not a perfect solution. Right. But it's certainly a massive step in the right direction. Absolutely. And and one thing I find really encouraging is that Google is making these forecasts publicly available. Yes. Through the flood hub. Yeah. And through open source data sets. So this this open access approach, I mean, it has the potential to empower researchers and organizations worldwide mm -hmm. to to really study and prepare for floods yeah and and potentially save countless lives it's a fantastic example of how technology can really be used for good yeah. you know this yeah. open access approach not only democratizes access to this critical information right but it also fosters collaboration on this on this global scale it does which accelerates the progress in flood prediction and disaster preparedness now, before we wrap up this part of our deep dive, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about these virtual gauges that were mentioned in the Google materials. Yeah. It, it sounds like a pretty fascinating concept. W what are they and, and how do they work? Yeah, so virtual gauges are, are really this brilliant innovation okay. that addresses one of the fundamental challenges of flood forecasting, mm -hmm. which is the need for real world data right. to actually validate the model's predictions. So while the AI can predict stream flow anywhere, okay. It needs those real world measurements to confirm its accuracy. Right. So, virtual gauges are basically locations where the AI model predicts stream flow. Okay. Even though there are no physical gauges in those locations. Oh, interesting. To provide that historical data for validation. So it's like the AI is creating its own data points exactly. to fill in the gaps where, where traditional monitoring is lacking. Exactly. And this data, which is available on the Flood Hub, right. allows experts to study flood impacts, even in these data-scarce regions. So it's a powerful tool for understanding and mitigating flood risks yeah. in areas that have historically been underserved. Mm -hmm. So it's a really remarkable example of how AI is pushing the boundaries of what's possible in flood forecasting. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's it's a testament to uh, the ingenuity and dedication of, of these researchers who are constantly pushing the boundaries of, you know, what's possible with AI. Yeah. It's, it's really inspiring to see how how this technology is being used to tackle this you know, really critical global challenge. Uh, speaking of challenges, the Nature paper also emphasized that the the accuracy of this Google AI flood forecasting model, right. it's directly tied to the quality of the weather forecasting data that it receives. Oh yeah, that's a that's a that's a crucial point. Um, you can kind of think of it like baking a cake. You know, okay. if you use bad ingredients, the cake's not going to turn out right, no matter how good the recipe is. Right. So in this case, if the precipitation forecasts uh, that are feeding into the AI model are inaccurate, stream flow forecasts that come out are also going to be off. Right. So it's all it's all interconnected. Yeah. Improvements in weather forecasting will directly benefit the the accuracy of the flood forecasting model as well. Exactly. Yeah. It highlights the importance of of continuous improvement across across all aspects of these systems. And on that note, the, the the paper's authors also also stressed the need for even more open source hydrological data yeah. to to help refine these AI models. Oh, absolutely. The more data these models have to learn from, yeah. the better they become at, at recognizing these patterns and making accurate predictions. It's it's like teaching a child to read. Hmm. The more books they're exposed to, the the richer their vocabulary and their comprehension become. They specifically mentioned the the Caravan project. Yes. Which is creating this this massive uh, open database of hydrological data. Yeah, the Caravan project has the potential to be to be truly transformative. Imagine a global library of of hydrological data, you know, right. freely accessible to researchers and scientists worldwide. I mean, that kind of shared knowledge base could fuel like this rapid acceleration in the in the development and the refinement of of these flood forecasting models, right. which would ultimately benefit, you know, communities everywhere. It's it's exciting to think about the possibilities. Now, the the Nature paper also pointed out that that while this AI model is is incredibly effective at predicting riverine floods, mm -hmm. 
there's still a long way to go in predicting other types of, mm. of flood-related events. That's right. They highlighted flash floods, urban floods, and, and coastal floods as as areas where further research and development are needed. Yeah. And each of these presents, you know, its own unique set of challenges and complexities. Right. For example, flash floods, they occur very rapidly. They're very localized, which makes them notoriously difficult to predict. Urban floods, they're often influenced by human-made infrastructure. Right. Like, like storm drains and paved surfaces. Yeah. Which can alter water flow patterns. Oh, yeah. And coastal floods are impacted by this, this complex interplay of of tides and storm surges and sea level rise. So so it sounds like there's there's no shortage of work to be done in this field. No, not at all. But it's it's a it's a dynamic and evolving field with with immense potential for for innovation, yeah. you know, as AI technology continues to advance right. and as more data becomes available, mm -hmm. we can expect to see, you know, even more sophisticated and, and more accurate flood forecasting models emerge which will help us you know, better yeah. understand and and prepare for and mitigate the the risks of these of these powerful natural events. And speaking of AI's potential, the Nature article it touched upon its its role in predicting the location and extent of flood inundation. Right, which can be really crucial for for emergency response and planning efforts. Yeah, that's an area that's that's ripe for exploration. Imagine using AI to not only predict when and where a flood will occur, mm. but also to actually model its potential impact in in detail. Right. You know, showing which areas are likely to be underwater mm. and to what depth. Wow. I mean, this could revolutionize evacuation planning, resource allocation, disaster relief efforts. I mean, it's like it's like having a crystal ball that shows you exactly what the flood's going to look like. Exactly. And where the greatest impacts will be. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. And and the potential applications of AI in disaster prediction, you know, they extend far beyond floods. Uh, it's already being explored for predicting earthquakes, wildfires, Wow. Even volcanic eruptions. I mean, the the possibilities seem limitless as we continue to unlock AI's ability to analyze these vast amounts of data right. and, and identify patterns that, that might elude human observation. It's incredible to think about how, how AI is transforming our our ability to to understand and respond to to the natural world's complexities and challenges. Right. But but let's let's shift our focus back to the to the technical details of, of Google's new flood forecasting model. Oh. The the Google blog post that we have, it, it goes into some depth about about the advancements that have led to its its impressive accuracy and expanded coverage. It's a fascinating look under the hood, so to speak. Yeah. One of the key factors that they highlight is is the use of Google DeepMind's medium range global weather forecasting model. Mm -hmm. Can you can you explain why that's so significant? Yeah, so it, it, it makes perfect sense to incorporate, you know, a, a state of the art weather forecasting model as as input data. Right. Because after all, as we as we discussed earlier, the the accuracy of any AI based prediction system really depends on the quality of its input data. Yeah. And and this particular weather forecasting model uh, developed by Google DeepMind. OK. It can make these medium range predictions with with higher accuracy than traditional methods, especially for variables like precipitation and temperature. Temperature, yeah, which are which are crucial for flood forecasting. So it's a case of of different AI systems working together, each one contributing its strengths to create this more more robust and powerful overall solution. Exactly, it's a it's a beautiful example of synergy in action. And they didn't stop there. Yeah, the the team at Google they also tripled the amount of labeled data that was used to to train this new model. Wow. Primarily using data from the the open source Caravan project that we talked about earlier. That's a that's a fantastic example of how how open source initiatives can really accelerate progress in AI development. Mm. You know, by by pooling data and expertise from around the world, right? We can achieve you know a scale and a level of detail that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And this this expansion in training data has has significantly improved the the model's performance, yeah. particularly in those data sparse regions. It really underscores the importance of having, you know, diverse and, and representative data for for training these AI models. Right. The the more examples that the model is exposed to, mm -hmm. the better it becomes at generalizing and, and making accurate predictions across across different regions and scenarios. The Google blog post, it it delves into some of the the technical intricacies of how they how they built the model which right. which gets which gets pretty complex. It does it does get into the weeds a bit. Yeah. But there are there are some interesting nuggets in there. Uh 
they mention using an embedding based LSTM architecture. Okay. Which might sound kind of intimidating. Yeah. But it's it's essentially a type of neural network. Okay. That's particularly well suited for handling time series data, mm -hmm. like the data that's used to predict floods. Okay. <gasps> They also mentioned something called a countable mixture of asymmetric Laplacians distribution. Okay. Which, if I'm being honest, went went a little over my head. Don't worry, that one's a mouthful even for experts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but in in simple terms, it's it's a way to represent the probabilistic nature of of flood events. Okay. So instead of giving you know a a single deterministic prediction, mm -hmm. the model provides a range of possible outcomes. Right. Each with an associated probability. So so rather than saying this is definitely going to happen, right? It's saying there's a certain chance of this happening, and here's here's how likely these different possibilities are. Exactly. That that probabilistic approach provides you know a much richer and and more nuanced understanding of the of the risks involved yeah which allows for more informed decision making it's like having a, a weather forecast that tells you there's a 60 percent chance of rain yes instead of just saying it will rain or it won't rain exactly yeah great analogy now we've talked about the the impressive capabilities of this model but how do they actually know that it's that it's working as intended. Right. How, how do they validate its accuracy, especially in those, you know, ungaged watersheds where where traditional data is scarce? Right. That's that's a great question. Yeah. And the the Google blog post um, outlines some innovative approaches that they've taken. Okay. So engaged locations where you have you know these historical discharge measurements. Right. They use standard cross validation techniques to evaluate the model's performance. Mm. So essentially, they're they're testing the model on data it hasn't seen before, right? To see how well it generalizes to new situations. It's like giving a, a student a practice test to see how well they've learned the material. Exactly, but in ungaged regions right, where right. that where that ground truth data is lacking, yeah, they've they've had to get more creative. Okay, I'm, I'm intrigued. How do they how do they validate the model in those areas? So they've turned to satellite imagery. Okay. Specifically, images from synthetic aperture radar, or SAR. Okay. To help fill in the gaps, SAR can actually detect historical inundation events. So they're using satellites to see where floods have happened in the past. Exactly. Even if there were no gauges on the ground to record that data. That's right. By comparing those satellite-derived observations to the model's, you know, hydrological predictions, mm. they can actually assess its accuracy in these data-sparse regions. So it's it's a brilliant example of leveraging multiple data sources yeah. to to create a more comprehensive and robust validation system. It's like it's like having a detective use different pieces of evidence to to build a complete picture of what happened precisely yeah. and and they have another clever trick up their sleeve which is which is validation extrapolation okay so if they've validated the model at one location mm -hmm. using either gauge measurements or or sar imagery right they can extrapolate that validation to nearby hydrologically similar locations rio so if they know the model works well in in one type of watershed yeah they can they can assume it'll likely perform well in similar watersheds nearby. Exactly. Even if they don't have direct validation data for those specific locations. That's right. It's a way to expand the model's applicability and and build confidence in its predictions, even in regions where traditional data collection is limited. It's a it's a really thoughtful approach to to ensuring that the model is is as reliable and accurate as possible. Yeah. Even in the in the face of of data challenges. It really speaks to the the rigor and the attention to detail that that underpin this project. And and the the Google blog post emphasizes that they that they only make forecasts publicly available right. for locations where the where the model's quality has been thoroughly vetted. That's a crucial point, you know, transparency about the the model's limitations and uncertainties. It's, right. it's essential for building trust. Yeah. Users need to understand, you know, the reliability of the predictions right. before they can make informed decisions based on them. They also mentioned that they're working on an API yes. that will provide real-time forecasts with a 7-day lead time. That's huge. Which, I mean, that'll be incredibly valuable for researchers and uh, potentially for a wide range of, of other applications. That's exciting news. An API makes it much easier for, for developers to integrate these forecasts into, into other systems and tools. Mm -hmm. Which could open up all sorts of possibilities. Now, despite all these advancements, the, the Google team is very clear that this is... 
this is just the beginning. Of course. Yeah. That's that's the nature of scientific exploration. Yeah. There's always more to learn, more to refine, and more to achieve. What are some of the the areas that they've identified for future development? So they highlighted a, a, a few key areas. Mm -hmm. One is is expanding coverage to even more locations globally mm -hmm. for for riverine floods. Mm -hmm. um, while they've made significant progress, there are still regions where the model's applicability is limited right. by by data availability or or other factors. Right. Um, they're also working on expanding the model's capabilities yeah. to encompass other types of flood events, okay. like those flash floods, urban floods, and coastal floods that we talked about earlier. Right. And of course, they're they're constantly working to improve the model's accuracy and reliability. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's it's clear that there's there's a lot of, of exciting work still to be done in this field. Absolutely. The the potential of AI to to help us understand and, and mitigate flood risks is vast. Yeah. And and still largely untapped. So so as we as we wrap up this part of our deep dive, let's let's take a moment to to reflect on what we've learned. Okay. We've we've explored the the devastating impact of of floods, particularly in in developing countries. Mm -hmm. We've we've delved into the technical details of of Google's new AI powered flood forecasting model. Right. It's it's impressive capabilities and the and the rigorous processes that are used to validate its accuracy. Yeah. And we've we've discussed the the importance of of open access to to data and technology in, in accelerating progress. Yeah. And making a real difference in, in people's lives. It's been a fascinating journey and, and it's a it's a testament to, to the power of, of human ingenuity and collaboration yeah. in the in the face of, of complex global challenges. It's a reminder that that we have the tools and the knowledge to yeah. make a, a positive impact. We do. And that and that by working together we can we can create a safer and more resilient world for for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, it really does feel like we're we're at a turning point in how we approach, you know, disaster prediction and preparedness. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not just about the technology itself, mm. but but also about this this spirit of open access and collaboration yeah. that we've that we've seen throughout, you know, both the Google blog post and the Nature article. Yeah, you've you've hit the nail on the head. The fact that Google is is making these forecasts and these data sets right. freely available mm. through the flood hub it's it's a game changer yeah and and initiatives like the caravan project which is bringing together these researchers from around the world to create this this vast open database of hydrological data right i mean those are those are absolutely crucial for for driving progress mm. and making these tools as effective as possible it's it's like a global community coming together to build you know, a shared shield against a common threat. Exactly. And it's a reminder that that even in the face of of these, you know, these daunting challenges, human ingenuity mm -hmm. and and a willingness to collaborate can can make a real difference. Well, I, I think that's that's a perfect note to end on. Yeah, uh, we've, we've covered an incredible amount of ground in this in this deep dive from, yeah. from the human impact of of floods oh, to God. to the technical intricacies of AI modeling yeah. and and the the inspiring spirit of of open access and collaboration that's that's driving progress in this field. It's been a, a pleasure exploring these topics with you, and I and I hope our listeners have have found it as as thought provoking and informative as we have. I'm sure they have. Yeah. And and as always, we we encourage you to continue exploring these ideas further. Yeah. You know, consider the questions that we've raised, mm. and and perhaps even you know imagine new possibilities for how AI can be used to create a, a safer and more resilient world for, for everyone. After all, the future is shaped by those who, who dare to imagine it. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Until next time.